This book is like 11 days old. Yeah. So that came out on the third. No, it's so it, it? It, it's like 15. It came, 15? Out, came on the 29th. Okay, 29th. Yeah. So I just want you all to know, you guys have like a brand new nascent book here. And um, as you can tell from all my little sticky notes, I have been really enjoying um, this at night. I was telling Charlotte that I fell asleep with it. And it's a really heavy book to fall asleep <laughs> with. But it's com completely worthwhile. Um, one of the uh, like one of the first questions I wanted to ask you was that um, you mentioned that it's really risky to do an anthology from scratch, and what inspired you to do you know to take this approach on um, this type of uh, book? Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for having me here. It's very exciting. Um, I was angry. I don't know if you guys have um, seen Rebecca Traster's book, Good and Mad, where she talks about the power of women's anger to get things done and why we're constantly being put down for being angry because of that. But I started to get really angry when the Me Too movement, sort of that whole groundswell happened um, and it hit the food world. And it was really the first time I think when you're a journalist, you spend so much time trying to write stories about other people or other things that are happening. So you don't necessarily take a beat to look at what's happening in your own backyard. And I think I finally took a moment to start thinking just about, OK, so as a food writer person in my food media landscape, what are things that I think have happened to me and the other women in my industry within this Me Too conversation. And a lot of that wasn't even about the obvious, you know, bad men of food media, which we have. A lot of it was more about those moments where you realized that you were made to feel small or you didn't pitch something because you somehow instinctively knew that you weren't supposed to pitch that, that you wouldn't get that. So I just started thinking about all the ways in which we had been pigeonholed and reduced and I started to get angry. And I think what made that worse was just that food writing was one of the only things that women were allowed to do in terms of practicing journalism um, and getting published. And so the fact that in the last two plus decades, food has kind of ballooned as content. Um, and to see the legacy that women built getting, if not kind of stepped on, then just kind of pushed aside so that men could do more of the splashier stories. Men could be the editors in chief of magazines. So for me, it was taking a minute to ask what had happened in my own backyard. And as soon as that started, I thought, if I feel this way, I have to imagine the other women in my industry feel this way. I have to imagine that women of color feel it like exponentially more. And so I thought, what if I could create a space where we were not limited. What if I could create something where we could write what we wanted and we could write it how we wanted and then expand that so that it wasn't just about food writing, which I think can be a little bit myopic in a sense, but where we could get other women talking about their own experiences. And so that it would be about writing, but it would also be about more than that. That was, that was why I wanted it to be from scratch. I wanted it to be completely original so that no one was fettered. And, and that brings up, like, what you just said, a great segue to your very first um, story by, by Sadie in that she actually writes about something that we all feel like we should be doing. And she opens it up. And I, I don't know if I should be like giving away the book or not. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's OK to give a okay. little bit away. So, it's okay. um, but she, she, she writes about how she doesn't like um, this particular food writer that we, we've all read probably and heard about, and um, how it was like, it was a, a revelation to you as well. And I can honestly say it was a revelation to me. It felt like um, a big cloud had been lifted, and I was given permission to not like MFK Fisher. So I never really liked MFK Fisher, and it was this thing where you felt like there was something wrong with you because she's held up as the patron saint of food writing. And I think what 
Sadie's essay gets at it's really I don't want to I don't want to give it to away too much but her writing style is so particular and wonderful that it I, no matter how I describe it it's not going to have the same effect as reading it but for her she noticed that men kept giving her copies of MFK Fisher's work and I think a lot of the reason that MFK Fisher has loomed so large actually comes out of men endorsing her because men felt I think in some ways that she was writing a little bit like a man. I mean Sadie gets into this a little bit but anyway we're all supposed to love her and of course it's like oh you're doing a, a book about women and food and, and women's writing it's like God forbid you disparage MFK Fisher, but the truth is, Sadie does not respond to her. I don't respond to her. You don't respond to her. But I do think it's pretty cool to start an anthology that's supposed to celebrate women in food by challenging one of the women that we've been told we're supposed to adore. Right. Yeah. And, and then also the fact that her name, like we know her as MFK Fisher. And part of it is because she was a woman trying to break into food writing and she actually, a lot of women of that era had to use their initials so that nobody knew yeah. they were actually women. Betty Fussell, who is uh, 92 years old and is the first woman interviewed, there, there are a series of interviews um, with different women in food, not all of them writers, they're all different kinds of, of jobs in food. Um, but Betty Fussell's the first, she's 92, she's an amazing writer and adventurer um, and she says when she first started she also had to create sort of a pseudonym or she just used her initials similar for, for exactly the same reason. So how many of you out there have actually read MFK Fisher and do you feel the same or differently? <laughs> what kind of distance from her until I was in Aix-en-Provence and then I understood it a lot more. There was there's a, um, a place about her travel writing that makes sense in that um, when you're in France, it makes sense. But I understand what you mean. And I would argue not to be like bitchy about MFK, but for her to do her job, the whole point should be that we're not there and she can take us there. You know, you shouldn't have to be there to understand what she was trying to communicate. So there you go. <laughs> MFK, MFK Fisher, completely overrated. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to a different question. Um, so a lot of the interviews and the essays, well, actually, I'm going to ask one question. What made you kind of flex between having people write specifically for the book and then also do interviews? Well, my, okay, this is a terrible thing to admit. <laughs> Because I write nonfiction, right? I mean, I write about food, I write stuff, I write reported stories. I wrote a book about women in food before I did this. I've written cook cookbooks, but what I like to read, I like to read fiction. I actually don't really love reading nonfiction for pleasure. It's rare, it's very rare. So there's a part of me <laughs> when you embark on something like this where you think, wow, I'm making a book I probably wouldn't read. So <laughs> my, my thinking about that, you know, I, I associate it with academia. I associate uh, anthologies in particular. You know, it's like one essay after the other. It can get a little heavy. And I just thought I want to make a book that people don't necessarily want to read through in order, where if you don't want to read a whole bunch of essays, there's other stuff for you in there. I also didn't want to limit it to food writing, and this allowed you to have women in the book who are not writers, who I think are really important and whose voice I wanted to have amplified. Um, but it was also kind of, it's a little bit meta, but if you're trying to create something where you're saying to women, go do what you're normally not allowed to do. You're sort of trying to break the mold. And I think you want to play with the format in the same way or else it's not completely effective. So it's like if we're going to expand what women are allowed to say and who they're allowed to be, why not also expand the idea of what an anthology could be? So I think those two things played to each other. But I also really just wanted it to be a fun read. I, I didn't want people to be like, ugh, like MFK Fisher. I didn't want it to be a book that you thought you should read, but you didn't actually really want to read. Yeah. Oh, no, you're going to want to read this. So. <laughs> um, but it, you, you bring up a good point. It's like you, you wanted it to be fun. Yeah. But at the same time, you bring in a lot of serious themes. <laughs> and how, when you were putting the, the stories in order, how did you balance that? 
It was, I really love, like, I've always loved magazines, print magazines. And since I was pretty young, I was always drawn to the table of contents page. I love seeing how people put a magazine together and not just the individual parts of that, but how they all speak to each other. So for me, it was challenging, but incredibly fun. And it was also, I kind of wanted it to be organic. So I didn't want to impose the order too early in the process. I wanted to see once I had everything and then start to, you re, what's cool about when you do something like this, where you're not, you don't know ahead of time what the content's gonna be, is that you find these themes that you didn't realize you were going to find. So you realize these topics that come up a lot and they don't necessarily come up in ways that you had thought about. like women working at home or motherhood or race or they're, they're just all of these things that come up and they don't always come up in the expected way. And once you sit back and start to look at that, you can play. You can start to put things next to each other, which once they're juxtaposed, draw out those themes. Um, and I think that's my, you know, my thinking was people are likely not to read this in order, but if they were to read it in order, how can I give it some kind of flow, even if it's not always obvious? Um, you mentioned that uh, you like magazines, and and um, I just found out that Charlotte was an art has a minor in art history and was going to go for her PhD. I, I have a master's, master's, and I'm a lapsed doctoral student of art history, <laughs> despite having been an English major and clearly doing nothing with art history now. But so, <laughs> but we were talking about the the actual layout of the book, um, and. I loved the the eyes, and I I was like, why are there eyes on potatoes? And obviously, their potatoes have eyes. But I was um, like extrapolating my own thoughts as to why you have this cover. Do you mind kind of? Yes. Well, again, in that spirit of if we're gonna mess with an anthology, then we also I wanted it to be visually really cool looking, right? Because again, not expected for an anthology at all. And I also knew I wanted some visual essays in there, so it was like you know, um, and Abrams is the publisher, and they're known for making art books. So this was one thing I knew they were gonna do really really well. So the first thing I just want to say is that the designer of the whole book, when you see the layout and how it's done and the use of color and the use of fonts, um, the woman who did that, her name's He Song Lee, and I just think she's incredibly talented, so I like to make sure everyone hears her name and goes and looks at her work. Um, the cover is interesting because there is a graphic essay in the book. I knew I wanted one, and the first person I asked to do that was... Um, an illustrator and author named Tamara Shopson, who's done a few books of her own that are amazing. She also does a lot of illustrations for the New York Times and the New Yorker. And she and I had worked together and I had an idea for something she could do, but my way of going about doing this with the book was I would make sure I had ideas for everyone, but I would let them come to me with ideas first, because again, I didn't want to impose anything on them. So I sent Tamara an email and I was like, Tamara, I'm doing this book. How would you feel about having 10 pages to play with? You could do whatever you wanted. It would be word and image, and it just has to do with food and women in some way. Tamara emailed back and she was like, I'm so busy right now, but also, Charlotte, I have nothing to say about women and food at this moment. And I was like, she was very nice about it, but I was like, oh, okay. And I ended up um, asking an amazing woman named Carolita Johnson to do the essay, and it's beautiful, and I'm so happy. But a few months later, um, I was checking in with my editor at Abrams, and I think I'd sent her some sample material so she could see my progress, and she said, wait till you find out who's doing your cover. And I was like, who? And she said, Tamara Shopson. So <laughs> it seemed like fate. I actually got teary at my desk. Um, and this is Tamara Shopson's cover. And what I love about it, um, I really did not like the title. I kept wanting to have clever titles. I had all these very clever titles. And my editor kept rolling her eyes and just being like, no, just no, like too much. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, women on food, it says what it is. I was like, it's so generic though, and the whole point is that this isn't generic. And then I saw Tamara's cover, and yes, it plays with the idea of the eyes of the potato, but it's also literally women, because those eyes are drawn to look very feminine, women on food, women on the potato. So for me, now I love the title of the book, and it's it's all because of Tamara's cover. <laughs> yeah, I was um, looking at it and thinking, like the eyes and it's everybody's perspective, like yeah. all these different perspectives 
of women in food and their experiences and yeah I, yes I and was just you, a you could get like really deep into it and talk about like the male gaze and the idea that it's the women looking out at you too, which is also cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So in the world of food writing, are there particular food terms or buzzwords you wish could go away? And I think that was also one of them. Yeah, that it's interesting because that this week we there was like an article about this taken from the book and I guess it blew up. So it's in my mind, but I asked the women who filled out my crazy survey, it was huge, like it was an undertaking. Um, words that they really didn't like seeing used to describe women, but also food, uh, men too. And badass was the number one winner. Um, women being described as badass, but also they did not like hearing men described as badass, um, which is really interesting. A lot of them also just didn't even like woman or female being used um, when we're talking about, you know, chefs or writers. It's just like, why do we even need that? Um, personally, myself, I'm less the, the gendering of it bugs me less, although it does bug me. But lately, I find myself annoyed with words like elevated. There's a lot of code that goes on that's sort of an authentic, which become ways to talk about things that are that are not white a lot of times or when cuisines from other cultures are then cooked by white people, the language we use, a lot of that. So that which is not in the book, but for me right now, not having done the book and like I hate badass. I hate it. I actually wrote an obituary for badass. <laughs> <laughs> I had to cut it. We did not have room, but like definitely I hate it. But I think now I've been thinking more about other loaded words that might not even necessarily be gendered. Oh, can you give us some? Well, I, th I think elevated, elevated and authentic are really good examples of that. I mean, I do think, again, people might be more inclined. People tend to feminize uh, cuisines that are non-Western. So in that sense, you might find something that a woman made called authentic, whereas a guy can do it and it's suddenly like elevated. Like, they're, they're great. I'll give you an example. This is very specific, but... Um, Pete Wells, the New York Times restaurant critic, uh, who's an amazing writer, really beautiful writer. So I'm going to criticize this, but I still think everyone should read him. Um, he wrote a review of an Indian restaurant in Queens called Ada, which is a great restaurant. And he described how the chef was doing food that we really don't see in New York. It's food that you would have in India that we don't, you know, and he basically wrote it in a way that described it as, as being authentic, right? Um, now, around a month ago, he did a review of a pizza place um, in, it's in, I guess it, it's in New Jersey, but it's in like the Heights, New Jersey City Heights. Anyway, the, the chef there is doing a certain Roman style pizza and he's doing it exactly the way he's had it in Rome. So he's not like interpreting it. He's not, it, it, and the word he used for it was elevated. And I find that fascinating. I find why is one person when they're doing, when they are Indian and doing Indian food and doing it in a way that is true to as you would find it in India, why that would be presented more as authentic and why when a white person doing pizza in New York in a way that is also true to how it would be in Rome, that suddenly would be considered elevated. So that's kind of what I mean. I don't know if that's a helpful example. Yeah, I think um, in one of the survey questions, it, uh, one of the um, two people responded saying that they were excited that Mexican and Chinese food should be getting the same kind of appreciation as a, you know, other more Western French or even Japanese food, right? Because those two are considered to be cheap and should be cheap. And there's that, that kind of classism to food. Um, the other is I, when you were talking about male versus the female, I, I studied in France and I remember being in Lyon, the bouchons were for women and they were considered women's food, but the restaurants were all for men. And the men were able to actually cook there. So it's um, it's a long-standing tradition, I think. It is, and it's and a lot of it does come out of, of the French tradition, and it just continues to boggle my mind that we still hold that up 
as the model and we don't look at other kinds of cuisines and the way that they've structured their kitchens or even just the way that food is prepared and see that as an equal alternative. It's always somehow compared against what comes out of France and that's true of how we define restaurants um, as well as how a kitchen's organized or even how we think, yeah, a dish should be made. Yes. The brigade and then the whole entire center, yes. the plate and everything. Yes. Yeah. One question I have in here that was regarding mothers and what they taught their daughters about that. I, as I told you before, I found the survey questions and every, it's in the, the green part of this book. Read those first. They're so fun. Um, but what about your mom? Like, what did she? Oh, that's such a good you? question. I, I just feel like for women, it's always presumed that if we cook, it's because our moms must have cooked. Like that this is like some tradition. And for so many women, that is not true. Like, it's just not. That's a very dated stereotype in a lot of ways. I actually grew up with a mom who cooked, <laughs> um, who cooked all the time, but she cooked, you know, she didn't cook because she had to. She cooked because she wanted to. For My mom's more of a hobbyist cook, and that, I think that's such an important distinction. I think, you know, so many women who are mentioned in that section might not have been great cooks or cooked a lot, but they were still responsible for feeding their families. And I think that is always really interesting when it's not necessarily about my mother was a great cook. It's more my mother did the best that she could. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, my mom really cooked for fun, and she's great. She's a great cook but for her it was more like a choice you know it was her alone time she'd go in the kitchen she'd close the door she'd blare music like so you weren't allowed in the kitchen to learn what, from her a little bit it depended if she would for prep like we bake together every week I love baking I would come home from school on Thursdays and she would come home from work early on Thursdays and we would bake together um which I loved and she would let me help but when she was doing like dinner if it wasn't prep like the hour leading up to dinner door closed music blaring so like it was it was you know when things were starting to get like more frenzied mm -hmm. no that, then everyone out yeah I did that to my kids um, <laughs> as a former chef I was like they're all like oh your kids must have learned how to cook from from you I'm like no actually I couldn't stand the mess they made <laughs> so I just shoved them away and said you can eat the food <laughs> She was pretty, I was, I was curious and she was pretty encouraging, but I also like looking at all her cookbooks. So like, I didn't necessarily care I, for the baking. I wanted to be in the room, but for like, with the other stuff, it was more like, I wanted to know what she was making. I wanted to know what, why, but then if she kicked me out at the, at the end, also she would get nasty. <laughs> I think she'd get stressed out and she'd be kind of mean so it was like you didn't you didn't want to be in there not our best moments as, as no. parents you know I, I realize I'm also hogging up all of your time and I was just wondering if there were any questions out in the audience hi I'm wondering if you had your eyes on certain people that you knew you wanted to include in the book if you had relationships with everyone before or if you sort of used it as an opportunity to connect with people who maybe you wanted to work with but hadn't had the opportunity before to work with? Um, I love that question because both, it's both. Uh, for the essayist, which is where I started because I kind of felt like if I don't have the essays, like I don't have a book essentially. Um, for the essays, I just sat down and thought, okay, who do I like to read? Who do I most like to read right now? And most of them, because our community is so small, the food writing community, most of them I did know. Um, some I knew better than others. Some I knew more like the way you are acquaintances with people who do the same job you do because you're always reading each other's work but you don't actually know each other. And a few of them were actually people that I was friendly with. And I got really lucky because I think almost everyone said yes. Um, there's one actually, one of the photo essays um, is a friend of mine from college. We've been friends since we were freshmen. She's a photojournalist. She's been nominated for a Pulitzer. She, um, we always said one day we would like to work together and I just thought this could be the time that we get to do something together. But then for things like the interviews, which are women I admire, that was a chance for me to talk to women I had looked up to and didn't necessarily know or I knew because maybe I'd written a story and quoted them once, but you know, and then in terms of, I call it the chorus, the women who filled out the questionnaire and provide all those answers about their mother. Um, that was a real mix. And I think 
the best part of it for me and for the book is I feel like I've gotten to know women in my community who I did not know and I also feel very close to them. So the cool thing now about going on tour and even honestly in New York when we've had get togethers is I get to meet them in person for the first time. And like it's, it's actually really moving. I'm doing um, a panel tonight um, at the Ruby and it's with it's with three women. It's with Ellen Fort, who was at Sunset, but was at Eater before that, who I've I've never met, and she's actually not in the book. Um, but again, I think this book was about trying to represent a huge swath of people. So I imagine in my mind that the book is for Ellen, even if she's not in it. But we've never met. And then it's Solejo, who is you guys probably know as the San Francisco Chronicle critic, and she wrote an essay for the book. Um, and also Tian Lunho, who is a food writer I've admired for so long. But like, you know, we've now corresponded so much because I edited them and we've become friends. Soleil and I like talk often on social media, but I've never met them. So tonight I get to meet them for the first time, which, you know, I don't know that that's very cool. So for me, it actually the book, I think the book creates its own community. But personally, for me, it's definitely made me feel like I'm part of a really amazing community. Um, I have two questions. One is, can you share the clever titles that you had for the book? <laughs> I'm going to forget. There is one, there's a, there's a, okay, this is an art history thing. Um, Louise Bourgeois did a sculpture called Knife Woman, and I thought I wanted to call it Knife Women. <laughs> yeah, that, it's really cool. And also, if you see, now you guys, if you go, like, look up Louise Bourgeois Knife Woman and you see the image, you'll understand it's, like, so powerful. And I was like, that'd be cool. And, of course, my editor was like, no, who, who knows who Louise Bourgeois is and who knows what this image is? That's ridiculous. And then the other one, I still think it was, okay, this, I'm, this is going to get a little, we're going to, I'm going to get into it. The other one was, um, I was at lunch with my friend Helen Rosner, who is in the book, who is a food writer. She's the correspondent for The New Yorker, and she's just a brilliant writer and thinker. And we were talking about titles, and she was like, wasn't there a novel called like The Edible Woman? And it was, we, we, we realized it's actually Margaret Atwood's first novel was called The Edible Woman. And I was like, oh my God, it should be called Edible Women, plural, and it will be like this ode to Margaret Atwood, and isn't that so cool? Because of what the book is like, we thought we were geniuses, we were high-fiving each other. And <laughs> my editor was actually down with it for a while, and then, you know, people like to take things to meetings and like see how the room feels. Well, someone in the room raised their hand and said it sounded like oral sex. <laughs> and so we couldn't use that title because as soon as one person said it, it was like wah wah. So that was <laughs> that was that title. And I feel like that there there were some other ones that I really don't remember now, but I would send these like very late hour emails to my editor with like, I've got another one. And she just was like, You just you gotta stop. Like <laughs> you gotta stop. But those were the two that I just thought were like so great. And no. Yeah. <laughs> Sharing um well, I love the title that you landed on, and especially knowing the backstory with the picture, it's really, really good. Um, my other question was uh, the questionnaire that you sent out. Were there any um, responses that you got that like really surprised you or particularly stood out to you? Yeah, the one I think, co like collectively, um, I had this idea that I wanted to figure out a way to cover complicity. Um, in the book and just women's complicity in, I guess, you know, the white patriarchy, but really look at how we've treated each other and how much of that has been imposed on us and sort of how we're trying to work our way out of it. It's something we don't talk about. Like in all of the Me Too conversation, we don't talk about it. And I don't think we've found a way to do it that isn't um, destructive. So I had this idea that I would ask as one of the questions, you know, what are ways in which you've, you've been complicit? And the whole thing, anyone could have replied anonymously to any question, but for that particular question, I reminded everyone that it could be anonymous, because I know it's just, it's a hard question. And what surprised me, I was not expecting a lot of women to answer it in the first place. So many women answered, and most of them chose not to be anonymous, which is why I wrote an essay to, to sort of introduce that section of the book. 
Personally, I think it's the most powerful section of the book. Um, it's the I think it's the hardest section of the book. Um, there are a few others that are pretty intense. Um, but anyway, that was a huge, huge surprise to me. Um, I think that was probably the most surprising. There were also women who were like, why should I be filling this out? What is this? Because, you know, again, this was a whole leap of faith. It was me taking a leap of faith, but it was everyone who agreed to do the book taking a leap of faith because no one really knew what it was. Like, I could see it in my head, but I, trying to explain it, like, oh, it's going to be an unconventional anthology. It's going to be funny and serious, and we're all just going to get to, like, be ourselves. Isn't that great? Like, you, it's, <laughs> you send this questionnaire, and I'm telling you, that questionnaire, like, in hindsight, I'm like, wow, would I have filled out that questionnaire? Um... Yeah, so I, just in general, I think there were some people who were like, but why should I do this? What the hell is this? And like, you know, there are some women who said they were going to fill it out and then didn't. Some who just outright said, I'm really sorry, but I'm not comfortable with this. And, and which was fine. I actually, I appreciated that. I had some really good conversations because of it. And I think it made the book better because I became much more mindful of how I was going to use the information and what mattered and yeah. I was wondering if you were aware of a book called A Woman's Places in the Kitchen by Chef Ann Cooper that came out about 25 years ago, I guess. And it's an, another anthology of in, interviews with sh women chefs yes. and background. I just wondered if you were aware of that. And the other thing I wanted to ask you was I noticed that you interviewed some extremely wonderful people, including Kim Severson yes. in New York, yes. who used to be our San Francisco Chronicle, um, one of one of the many uh, criti critics here, and um, and Dory Greenspan, and I was wondering if you could say anything about those two lovely people. Yes, well, I am familiar with Anne's book. I wrote a book in, it came out in 2012 called Skirt Steak, uh, which was all about women chefs and their experiences in the kitchen, and that was a book that I looked at because I was trying to find out if there were other books that had been done and what they looked like, and that was how I first became aware of, of the book that Anne did. Um, so Kim Severson is... I say this in the in the in her introduction that I wrote for her. She's my favorite journalist. I look up to her most of of any journalist. And it's not so much because she writes about food, it's how she does it. And it's because she was uh, really one of the first journalists to politicize food, but also to treat it like it was news, not to treat it like it was some like fun lifestyle subject. Um, and I really loved getting to sit down and talk to her. And I feel like I was actually terrified <laughs> because when you look up to someone and she's like, you know, she has the appearance of being really tough because she's so serious about her work. Like she really doesn't mess around. And she's so, she's been so supportive of the book. Like I can't even tell you. It's really been when I was saying before that it's been for me a feeling like I'm part of a community, like that's definitely been part of it to have that kind of support from someone that I've looked up to for so long. And Dory, I don't even know where to start with Dory. Dory and I became friends a few years ago, um, I think because I love baking so much and I wrote about it a lot and I would often turn to her and her recipes and she had this cookie pop up. She eventually had her own cookie store, but before she had the store, she had a pop-up where she would just show up and do her cookies with her son. They, they were in business together. And I would just go. And yeah, we became friends. Like she's friends. She and her husband are friend with my friends with my parents now. Like I, I love Tori. <laughs> the reason I wanted her in the book, though, was not because we're friends and because I love her so much, but because I believe she is the best living recipe writer. I think the way she writes a recipe is just so incredibly thoughtful and clear and also um, unique. It's unique to her. And, you know, I didn't want to have a lot of recipes in the book because when you tell people, if you're a woman and you say, I'm writing a book about women and food, everyone just assumes it's a cookbook. And I really wanted to get away from that. But I also did not want to forget how recipe writing is its own art. It's hard and it takes a lot of skill and a lot of training. And it's also something that is it's so vital to our legacy as women in the food world and food writing. So the question was sort of how do you get 
that in the book without this being a recipe book. And so for me, it was, uh, okay, I want to take a moment for someone like Dory so that I can honor the skill of recipe writing. Um, and yes, she, she, I won't spoil the surprise, but there is actually a recipe in there from Dory. And that's, that's to answer your question, my Dory, my Dory story. Okay, so now I chef Dee Dee's gonna come up and cook. Is that, what's up? Yeah. And you're gonna talk about the, yeah. oh. Yeah. Do you want me to explain why the, why this recipe? So um, one of the women I interviewed for this book is Nigella Lawson. Um, and Nigella, like Dory, I just think is a brilliant recipe writer. And I love her recipes because she's really a writer. She's a writer first before she happens to be someone who writes about food or writes cookbooks. She loves language. And I love her use of language in her recipes. I think it's a British thing. Like the Americans, we don't seem to be allowed to use words like plonk and stuff like that in our recipe, you know, or like a knob of butter. Like, you know, where everyone likes to be precise here exactly how much butter. Um, but I just love her use of language. And she's also someone, she's really interested in the economy of a recipe. So she tests her recipes so that she can get them to be the most reductive they can be while still being good, but also still having a heart so that you read it and it's still a pleasure to read. And so um, we talk a little bit about her writing when I interviewed her and I thought it would be nice to have one of her recipes here today. And it's from her first book, which was called How to Eat, which um, I think it came out in like 1998. It, it, it's just celebrated its birth, like a, a huge birthday. Maybe 19, yeah, 1998 in the UK and I think 1999 in the US. Um, and it changed everything. I mean, it was what, she had been a journalist. She was not a food writer. It's what made, it changed her whole career and her whole life. But it was also for the Brits and I think for Americans, it was this book that gave everyone permission. It gave you permission to cook the way you were comfortable with and not have to be so perfect and also to cook food you just really wanted to eat. So when you see this book, there are chapters on like what she thinks of diet food, which she does not think much of um, because she doesn't think it's actually healthy. She thinks like, you know, the idea of what it could be is great, but like the reality of it is just not so good. She writes about, you know, cooking for your kids. She writes about cooking for one person. Um, it's just a wonderful book and it still holds up and it's, it's a, a joy to read. So um, anyway, I picked this recipe, which is, it's a fall recipe. This seemed appropriate. It's a mushroom ragu and it's like super meaty and flavorful, but it doesn't use a lot of ingredients. Um, it's also vegetarian. You can have it as a meal unto itself, which I think is pretty cool. And I, I don't know, Didi, I'll let you, I'll let you take it away. I don't know what you think of the recipe you may have. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> we talked a little bit about it before um, you all arrived, and it's a little bit old school. It fits perfectly for going into the fall season. Um, as a chef, I love mushrooms. I cook with mushrooms uh, every week at home, and we do lots of classes in kitchen sink with mushrooms too. So I think this is just a great dish. Can you talk, because one of the things I really like about it is that it uses two different types of wine which is a little bit unusual. Well, <laughs> I, I even wrote a story about this recently. I think Marsala is an unsung hero and it uses Marsala. So it <laughs> made me double excited about the recipe, but it uses red wine and Marsala. And I don't know if you want to talk about why both of those things, what each of them does in the recipe, but I just think that's pretty cool. Well, I think just the dry red wine in general, just a good base for sauces for, for mushrooms, but then the fortified umph of the marsala really just adds that added depth to dishes, which as chefs, we, we love that. And then I think there's a lot of butter in this dish. So if you go marsala and butter and mushrooms, you really can't go wrong. Um, Chef Didi, do you think the marsala adds a little bit of the, the sweetness that might be needed as well without adding sugar or a, another sweetener? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm going to get it in the dish here. So, yeah, the dry red wine. And then the marsala. So, Charlotte, um, Nigella Lawson also wrote a book called How to Be a, a Domestic Goddess, right? Yes. And it got a lot of 
people like me loved it, and I thought the cover as well as you know the writing and the name was great. But then she got a lot of pushback for that name. Yeah, title. I mean, I think it's unfortunate because in her mind it was a joke. It was a wink. when she did it, she did it with a wink. But I think people took it literally, and therein, <laughs> that's what created that problem. That was again her point was you know she wasn't doing fancy stuff in there. She and, and if I don't know if you guys remember the cover, I think it's like. It's not her licking the spoon, but it's almost like it's her licking the spoon. You know, it's like baking for one's own pleasure, which really does not have much to do with what we think of as a domestic goddess. A domestic goddess is about cooking for other people and, you know, doing that so well and without breaking a sweat. And she's totally not against breaking a sweat or being messy or dunking her finger in the batter in the bowl. So it, it, it was meant cheekily, as the Brits would say. And it, yeah, it definitely received flat because again, it was baking, right? Baking is like the most feminine thing. Like she's aware of that. I wanted to, sorry, I wanted to hear from you the word badass you hate, everyone hates. What's, um, from your perspective, like what's the underlying bias or issue there? Well, the interesting thing about badass is that it actually started out in the African-American community as a slang word to describe someone who was not going to succumb to the white man. It was like a word of resistance. It's like, it's actually, I think, a pretty cool word if you look at its origin. And then at some point, it got adopted as these things do by white people and white men started saying things like, oh, you're so badass. And like, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really know what that means. But to me, it seems indicative of like some kind of like swaggering bro like behavior, almost kind of like fratty, you know. And then after that, it then started subsequently getting used to describe women who had done things that were impressive to men because they seemed like masculine things to do. So when women showed bravado or when women did something like some, you know, athletic feat of daring do or when women, you know, and it got put on women chefs, but it was very much this sense that it was women chefs who were acting in ways that men thought were masculine. Um, and we started calling that badass. And I think what it does is, is it kind of invalidates other ways of acting like a woman or just acting like a woman at all. And I also think because it has become such a white thing, it kind of just says if you're not acting like a white dude at a frat party, who's just like, totally all in and like, yeah, I'm totally drunk and let him in and jump off the roof. It's so badass. Like that was a little extreme, but you know what I mean? I'm kind of just saying that like, you're not eligible for being considered like a cool person. Um, I also just think it's so ironic and sad that a word that once represented resistance is now kind of being used to describe something that's kind of basic and obnoxious, it's like bullying. This is how I feel about badass, like, yeah. I have one more. Like I said, I could completely dominate this whole <laughs> time. But um, in um, one of the essays by Mari, I um, can't remember her last name, about fashion, food and fashion, um, there was one quote that said, that was asking if we've moved backwards um, from, from this, because of this raw, raw feminism of, of really putting certain women up in the spotlight and then kind of ignoring the others. Um, do you think the women who were put in that spotlight or were asked to um, either dress a certain way and, and promote their, their brand were aware of that? Or do you think, you know, was it just an opportunity to get their name out there and to bring light to the fact that there there are women in the kitchen doing exactly the same work as men. Well, this gets to the complicity question in a lot of ways, right? Which is that complicity is technically built into any power structure. It's all, power runs on complicity, right? So it requires us to play along and often puts us in a position where we don't really have another choice. If, if we say no, then we're just left out completely, right? And I think in this case, I don't know, I can't speak for those women and how they felt about it, but I think it's sort of like, if I don't do this, then I don't do anything at all. 
And that can be a personal response saying, well, this is my business is what I do for a living. And if this is going to help me make money to keep my business going and open another business, like, am I not going to do it? But again, too, it's like if the choice is to have no women at all or to have women in this way, I mean, you could say this about the badass thing, too, then at what point do women feel like not even that they should say no, but also that they can say no. And this gets to the beginning of this whole book, which is that the ways in which we've been made to feel small or the way I felt like I couldn't pitch a certain story, like that I wouldn't be allowed to write a certain story, but I still want to write. So what what do I do? And I think that's that's the conundrum. I just added the sautéed onions with the celery and the marsala into the sautéed mushrooms. I'm working on the uh, the roux and the little bit of uh, to pull the ragu together. Do you have any thoughts on roux? Like, is there a trick to, to the roux? <laughs> I mean, it's classic for French cooking. I mean, you just it's a good thing to have in your back pocket, um, but um, and it makes things delicious. So again. More butter uh, to add to the dish. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, you said that you um, started writing the book because you were angry. And I was just curious did the process of writing the book make you like more angry or less angry or no difference? Uh, it made me, it confirms my belief that. So I used to think that the best way to make change was to get inside the establishment and then try and do whatever you could to kind of subvert it. And in the last two or three years, I've decided, no, that is not the answer. The answer is that we have to build other models so that we dilute what is considered the established model. Because as long as that is the established model and that system is in place, we're just going to keep coming up against the same thing. And really, even when you subvert something on some level, you're still validating it. So for me, it's kind of like, I want to see other people do books like this, make magazines. I want to go see people do independent projects. And I know that's hard because it's hard to get the backing for them. But I think the more we can present alternative models, and this is not just in publishing, this is for restaurants, this is for any business, the more we can present alternative models and alter alternative models that are created by women and by people of color and show that those are valid, that they're valid in terms of being interesting, but also that they're valid monetarily speaking, that they can be profitable. I think that's actually how you change things and you start to pull away from this idea that we have only one system and it defines everything else. So I think I feel less angry and more determined, if that's like a... So, Charlotte, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for today. having me, you guys. This is incredible. Thank you.